Hello YouTube, welcome back to Big Hairy Audio. This episode is The Problem with Loudspeakers. biggest problem with loudspeakers is also the best thing about loudspeakers and that is that no two loudspeakers are the same and what I mean by that is that every new design sounds a bit different from the last so we get something called translation error and what that is is when you're listening to one pair of loudspeakers and you move to another and the sonic qualities are different and you could say oh that's a great thing and, and yeah it is but it's also where the problems come in because a mix engineer will mix a track to sound a certain way they'll take it out of that studio where they were listening to those speakers and when they listen to it on a different pair of speakers or just a consumer will be listening at home on their their speakers you'll find that the mix isn't the same anymore the mix is kind of different and that's not as the artist intended, and that's really our goal here. Let's take that scenario for a second. A musician goes to a studio and they record their song, and they get their song mixed. And I guess the truest representation of that performance will be between those places. The recording studio where it was recorded, the mixing studio where it was cleaned up, and they delivered every nuance of that performer. And that mix engineer listening to those speakers in that moment is making all of the critical decisions which we as the listener want to hear. So that's our goal, to have the same pair of speakers as every mix engineer on the planet. And if every pair of speakers was the same, we all would. Okay, so that's obviously pipe dream. What a speaker, loudspeaker designers doing today all we're doing is building more and more different speakers, which, if you think about it, is taking us further and further away from that dream. One speaker. So, let's talk about the NS10 for a minute. The NS10 is a classic. And I've got to say, I've been a teacher of audio production and audio engineering for a number of years now, and I couldn't count on my hands the amount of times I've heard students say what about the NS10? Isn't that the speaker? And they're kind of right. The NS10 was used in studios all around the world and still is <clears throat> and therefore became a reference all of its own. If you listen to a mix on a pair of NS10s that mix was probably if not mixed on them, referenced. Therefore you are getting a flavour of the original artist intent. So that's great. The problem with NS10s is that they have a reputation for being flat. When I say flat, I mean the frequency response is linear from the low frequencies right up to the high frequencies. And I'm not sure why they have this reputation, because they're not. And very few speakers are even anywhere near flat. And those that are still aren't flat. And I love the NS10s, I own a pair myself. But what they are is a reference point, they're not the reference. So the NS10 was famously used by Bob Clear Mountain, who would travel between studios bringing his NS10s with him. Just, and that allowed him to listen to the main monitors with that reference point in mind, that's really useful. So what about speakers that measure flat? Well, a flat frequency response means that any frequency played is delivered at the same level. But there's another element to this, which is resonance. And if some notes last longer than others, you'll still have sonic coloration. 
that can't be ignored. When you're listening to a pair of speakers and they're resonating at certain frequencies for longer than others, it still makes the mix sound different, even if they measure flat. So the next thing I want to talk about is exotic designs, exotic drivers. Why do they exist if, realistically, a pair of NS10s will do? Well, as humans we want to progress, and these exotic designs often solve problems. There are problems with every pair of loudspeakers, NS10s included here. And then you've got those companies like PMC. Now PMC make transmission line design speakers, exotic cabinets I guess. They are particularly interesting because they are also used in mastering houses. Mastering houses is generally where the final adjustments are made on mixes and they'll be listened by a professional mastering engineer uh, and PMC have are really popular in those circles, so PMC have almost got a claim to being an industry standard of their own. So they are kind of a unique speaker manufacturer in that regard. They're doing something different, yet they're accepted by the community, mostly. You can find PMC speakers at Metropolis in London, Whistlelord in the Netherlands, and, and at Howie Weinberg's Mastering House in LA. So. Do these trends shift? Yeah, I think they do. For example, sealed speakers much like the NS10 used to be the norm, but I would argue that ported speakers have really taken over from sealed designs. And then we have the issue of one-way versus multi-way designs. So a one-way speaker system will have one source, one pinpoint source that provides all the frequencies. Now this is ideal because it means that all the sound is coming from one source and arriving in our ears at the same time. Great. The only problem with that is, it's very unlikely that one driver is going to be able to re reproduce the whole frequency range at any reasonably usable SPL. Therefore, that's why we start to break the frequencies into different drivers. So then you think, well, maybe if I use 10 drivers that would be ideal, because then I can get every single frequency being recreated perfectly. Great, but then you've got 10 sources, so you've got these 10 different places that the sound's all approaching us from. So this is just an everlasting argument, but generally in studios you mostly find two or three way systems. Examples of one way systems are the Auratone Sound Cube. These are really popular in studios as well, often just one mono speaker in the middle. They don't sound particularly extended, but there is something incredibly satisfying about the sound. The fact that it all comes from one place, they sound fast, they sound tight. And then three-way systems also sound fantastic. It's worth listening to. You get an extension of clarity that you're not quite used to with a two-way system. However, there's this kind of smearing between these three different drivers, which, particularly when you get familiar with a three-way system, you can't help but notice that separation between each of the drivers. So, is my conclusion that the most ultimate loudspeaker is the most generic? Well, yeah, it is. But how do you market the most generic loudspeaker? I mean, if you think about it, if you build a box that looks like all the others, and the features are the same as all the others, why is anyone going to invest in that? And what does this mean for designers who are trying to push the boat out, do something a bit different? I think it means that loudspeaker designers will be designing loudspeakers for loudspeaker enthusiasts. And there will be more of these than ever. It's in our human nature. We will want something a little bit different. We don't necessarily want the best, it's just like cars. There are tons of cars. If there was just one car that was the best car, give it five minutes and someone would design a different car that's not as good, but there'd be a market for it. We convince ourselves that we need different things. Choice is the spice of life. And it's the same with loudspeakers. We want loudspeakers which offer something unique, have a listening experience rather than just an accurate representation. And that's what I love about loudspeakers. What about designs over the last 20 years? Have we just been making silly products? 
or have improvements actually been made? Well here I'd like to point towards digital crossovers. I'm only a recent convert to digital crossovers myself, but I've read a lot about this subject and there's some considerable evidence that digital crossovers are a big step up over passive crossovers. Even active crossovers, just in general, are a big step up over passive crossovers. And this has all happened in the last 20 years, so yes, we've made significant progress in the field of loudspeakers in the last 20 years. And where are we going now? I don't know. And this is what's so exciting about this field. I foresee some really interesting things in the future of loudspeakers. So thanks for watching today. I've been Big Hairy Audio. See you around.